see people who have different kinds of careers and different kinds of jobs and hear about their life and their career paths and advice and so forth. Um, and so welcome. My name is Darren Hawkins. I'm the uh, chair of the political science department and the political science department sponsors the lecture series with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with our alumni association, which is the BYU Political Affairs Society. Um, some of you are enrolled in a, the lecture series class for credit. Uh, and if you are, please sign the roll in the back on your way out. And um, because we want to make sure that we, we take attendance. Um, we are expecting to, to spend about uh, 55 minutes together. I, I, I don't know, maybe uh, usually in the middle of the day we have to wrap up by five minutes too for people to get to class. That might still be the case. I, I'm not sure, but uh, at five o'clock, but, but um, uh, th that's, that's the basic plan. Um, uh, so that if people have places to go at five o'clock or whatever, we can, we can accommodate that. Um, if you have any questions, uh, I know I wasn't here last week. I apologize. I was uh, had a conference that always hurts the first week of classes when they have my annual conference that week. Uh, but Kelly Daniels, I think, was here and introduced the class and everything. Uh, you could certainly contact her or you could ask me about any kinds of questions that you have. But we're pleased today, so so with that sort of out of the way, uh, Let's get on to the, what we came here for. Uh, we're pleased today to welcome Ali Isom, uh, who is a graduate of the political science department here at BYU. And she currently works for Utah Governor Gary Herbert as his uh, chief of staff, communications director, and spokesperson. Uh, Part-time job. Uh, prior to her appointment, Allie worked in both the public service and in the and in private sector as well. She has experience managing uh, numerous campaigns, including the first two statewide campaigns of Utah Attorney General Mark Shirtliff, and she served on the Kaysville City Council prior to her uh, appointment as Chief of Staff. So uh, she has a wealth of experience, and we're very pleased to have her here. So welcome to Allie. It's, it's perfectly fine. I all just, right. I'm a walker, so I'll s try to stay in one place. That's all good. You if you've got it, a, if you've got a mic, that'd maybe, even be great. Yeah. I'll get we'll started and, we okay. Can get started and see if we can get you on. That's great, that's great. That formal, we can interrupt. Okay, <laughs> not a problem. <laughs> I, I, it helps me to know um, who my audience is, so I just want to get a feel for what you all are interested in right now. How many of you have chosen a major and you're locked in and you know what you're going to be when you grow up? Yeah? Okay, so political oh, science. The oh, the, the caveat at the end was what got you, huh? You don't know what you're going to be. Um, political science, how many? Okay, and then is it international relations you've also got in here too? Okay, those are always fun classes. What about other miscellaneous? What are you doing? What are you doing? Uh, health relations. Oh, awesome. Okay. Middle Eastern studies and Arabic. Wow, okay. Very needed. Um, is this working now? Does this work okay? Let me see if I can, that's much better. I just, uh, I just do better if I can move a little bit. Does it work for your recording purposes, volume wise? Yep. Okay, yep. awesome. Um, the reason I ask is, uh, I switched my majors a couple of times. I started out in public relations, took uh, core classes there, really enjoyed it, and decided I didn't want to haul my baby and my husband off to New York for an internship. My husband was in political science and he was about done and going to start grad school, and I just want to be done. So I finished up in political science with the plans of doing grad school. Only, as some of you may appreciate this perspective, um, the Lord intervened and some plans changed. So my first lesson today is, you know, be flexible and realize your life plan is important, but um, got to be willing to listen to the Spirit, because things don't always turn out the way you think they're going to. They may even turn out better. Um, I, let me give you a little overview of my role and my current post, and then I want to give you um, just an overview of, of some career advice and some, as you, as you contemplate um, where you go with your life and your life plan, some options that might be uh, interesting to you. Um, 
I am Deputy Chief of Staff and Communications Director. In all governor's offices, it's a little different. Some people are just a communications director. Some people are also the public information officer, spokesperson. Sometimes those roles are split. But we've had some serious budget cuts in this state. And um, the two of us who are deputy chiefs actually have two other roles that we play. So I oversee strategy and communications. And my primary responsibility is to make sure that our strategy is aligned with our public message. And it's, it's so tempting for a public official to talk about everything and everything they love and be all things to all people. And my job is to remind the governor and our staff that we're to stay focused on our priorities so that at the end of our tenure, we've actually accomplished something meaningful. Um, sometimes it's hard. There are public officials who are a little ADD or staffers who have their own agendas. And my role is really to keep the train on the track and make sure that we're headed in the direction we want to be going. Um, I am also the governor's spokesperson, which means I'm the only other person besides the governor uh, who speaks to the media at Liberty um, on specific issues. I, I represent him. I will handle media inquiries and be quoted as on the record. Uh, I interface with media sometimes on background as well and can provide them other staff. And I give other staff permission to speak on the record as needed if we have somebody with some technical experience or the governor's general counsel or sometimes our public lands guy. There are other folks who I will engage and invite them in a very controlled way to speak to the media. But we try to be pretty careful in the governor's office about who talks to the press. There are friends and um, there are also sometimes our um, antagonists and we wanna make sure that our relationship is cordial, friendly and professional, but that the right message goes out at the right time. So that's my primary duty. Um, in the office, there is a chief of staff. The other deputy is assigned as the state planning coordinator, and he oversees agency operations, and he is the portal into the governor's office for our state agencies, although I do work with the agencies on a number of issues surrounding their legislative strategy, their public messaging, and sometimes operational issues in the agencies with which I'm familiar. So sometimes we overlap a little bit, but um, that's generally how it's broken out, and then we have a policy advisor, we have a, 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 a general counsel, our, our attorney on staff, and we have an education advisor and an environmental advisor, which is in transition right now. So there are a number of us who are senior staff that advise the governor, but um, I can tell you that it's probably the communications director and the chief of staff who have the most impact on policy and strategy and outcomes. And we're probably the two staffers who spend the most time with the governor who kind of look inside his head the most and, and help other staff understand where we're going with things. So I've, it's a great job. Um, it's not a job I ask for. Um, let me give you a couple other points that I want to um, point out. I, you know, I got to forget to click here. <laughs> um, so my first thing when I, when I showed up to help the governor was, Governor, you're going to get reelected by leading, not by campaigning. Because I had a fear, having run statewide campaigns and having known Gary Herbert for 20 years, that um, his, his propensity would be to, to continue campaigning because he had just been officially elected. You know, he was... Um, in transition after Governor Huntsman left to serve as ambassador to China, and then Governor Herbert was elected on his own last November. And so he'd been in campaign mode for um, about a year. And one of the first jobs I had was to get him out of campaign mode and remind him that we weren't looking over our shoulder, we were looking forward. And his public statements needed to reflect that because at the time I felt like maybe they didn't. Um, I also make sure we're aligning everything strategic alignment. So when we go in to plan an agenda for a meeting or when we talk about where our priorities are, I structure agendas in a meaningful way. We have four cornerstones. Jobs and the economy are the first one. Second one is education. Um, the third one is Utah's ability to solve its own problems. Sometimes that overlaps into public lands and health care. And the fourth one is energy, that Utah needs to drive its ener future in energy. We have some significant issues that are going to hit this state in the next 20 years and our energy costs could easily triple and we could turn into California if we don't lay some foundation right now. And this is a real opportunity for leadership and it's a real responsibility to our future generations to make sure we've thought this through well. So that's one of the governor's cornerstones. If, if, if the issue doesn't fall into those four things, it's not top tier priority for us and we're not gonna talk about it um, at length. We're going to deal with those brush fire issues that inevitably come up, but my role is to keep us all focused on those key four issues. Um, and then I also do crises ma ma messaging. Um, there is a drama a day if you let it be. There are distractions everywhere. I probably feel two to three calls a day from agencies saying, 
Uh, we got this going on, you might want to be aware. This is going to hit the press tomorrow. Just had a reporter call on this. Uh, you know, we just had the 410s transition where we changed our work days from four days to five days. There was a lot of criticism around that. Um, I had agencies all over the place on that. I, I, I share with you some of the drama, but I'd rather not because I don't think it's newsworthy, but many of the agencies do and they're fearful of it. My job is to make sure that we're, we're managing those in an appropriate way, that if the governor needs to comment on it, we do, or if somebody else needs to s comment on it so we keep it one step removed from our office, we handle it that way. Um, if I feel like it needs to get out quickly and it's an in-depth issue, there are certain reporters I'm going to call ahead of time and, and, and give them the scoop. I handle mass media, social media, governor's interviews, and all this public speaking event. So I have a staff who work for me who write the governor's speeches, and sometimes we base that on input from the governor ahead of time. Sometimes we draft the speaking points and run those by him in advance and then validate it. But uh, Governor Herbert is one who does not like to improvise. He wants to be probably overprepared. And uh, we make sure he has sufficient uh, material, both background-wise and actual speaking points. So here's my first piece of advice here. And this is my overview today, or my theme, is show up step up, and lift up. And if I, those are the three things I want you to think about in terms of your career. The first one is show up. Um, I didn't believe this to be true. I sat in Bud Scruggs campaign management class here at BYU. This is why this is so surreal for me. Bud was uh, Governor Bangader's chief of staff, immensely talented, tremendously funny and witty. He was a great professor. And I was a Bud Scruggs disciple. I thought the guy walked on water. And he, he gave us this great campaign management um, class that was probably unparalleled to anything that was currently being offered at, in a university in Utah because Bud had real life experience. He and David Lovett are close friends and they had run Garn and Hatch's campaigns. So they knew what they were doing. And, and Bud told us as we're sitting in class, we're better prepared to run campaigns than anybody else out there running campaigns in Utah at the time. And I did not believe him. I thought it cannot be this easy. I take a class and I'm ready to go run a campaign. It truly was. When I got out in the field, I realized there wasn't any technical training for campaign management at the time. There wasn't anyone teaching us how to do it and do it well. Um, and I also realized that there aren't a lot of people who are not only prepared to do it, but actually show up to do it, who have the motivation to show up and find the opportunities. Um, the governor's office offers, uh, offers um, a couple of different options for students to get involved. We have some internship programs. We also have some volunteer opportunities. I have to tell you, I'm surprised how few applicants we actually have for those and um, how few people actually show up and say, I want to do that. I have to tell you, it's impressive when somebody has both the preparation and the motivation to show up and to show up well prepared. Um, Let me give you, let me go first into this part. I've served in various capacities and I, I've never applied for a job. Keep that in mind as we walk through this. Um, it's sort of a theme in my life. I've, I've not really ever gone seeking anything, but people, when you show up and you do your job, actually end up recruiting you. Um, I started, I, let me work backwards. I came from Workforce Services as Government Affairs Director there. Um, I was, before that, Deputy Director of the Department of Community and Culture, which is a small state agency that consists of um, library, history, arts and museums, housing and community development, ethnic affairs, Indian affairs. Um, loved it. It's the heart and soul of the state of, of Utah. Great agency. Workforce services is unemployment insurance, food stamp eligibility, Medicaid eligibility. Um, they, they regulate daycare. Uh, they, they help pretty much low income and, and um, underserved populations. Before community and culture, I had worked for r, &R Partners as a part-time consultant, um, worked on various lobbying efforts for them, worked on a couple of campaigns on their behalf. They are an integrated marketing firm, an advertising agency based in Las Vegas. They did the what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas campaign. I had absolutely nothing to do with any of their Vegas clients, I'll have you know. But they have offices in Utah. Um, they do the UTA ads. Uh, they do the parents empowered ads. Um, they have a number of, of public clients that I, I helped with as well. 
And you know, they, they gave me some really great experience in terms of st strategy and analysis. Before that, I ran the Attorney General's first two campaigns and a uh, number of state and local races my assistant threw on here, um, which is interesting because uh, Mayor Wall, he's now mayor, was my home teacher. I just moved to Taylorsville and he wanted to run for the city council. And I helped him defeat an incumbent, Jim Dunnigan, who was on the city council, who then turned around and asked me to help him run for the state house. I was sort of stunned because I didn't know Jim Dunnigan. Turns out to be a really nice guy. But um, helped with house races, senate races, commission races, and that's kind of how I cut my teeth. And I did campaigns between babies. And then before that, did an internship for my husband, who was the PR director at Utah Public Employees Association. I don't recommend working for one spouse. It's not a good arrangement. <laughs> Um, but gave me some great writing experience in terms of speeches. I ghost wrote a lot of speeches, did a publication for them, um, and just kind of cut my teeth on writing. Um, you know, these races represent about 10 years of my life. As I mentioned, I have four kids in between all of those races, and um, it, was, it, was the, it was a great way to fill my time and keep my skill set and keep me busy. I'm, I'm a mom who gets involved and does PTA and coaches and and volunteers, and um, in this transition about this time in my life, I decided it was time to start getting paid for all the volunteering that I was doing. So, um, started getting paid slowly, and most of the time I had an arrangement at DCC and at Workforce Services. I was part-time, uh, with the exception of the legislative session when I was full-time, because I'd spent some time volunteering on these campaigns and knew a lot of legislators, wanted to um, have an impact on the Hill. That's when I was full-time, but Life balance required that I be part-time the rest of the time, and both of those agencies wanted me full-time, and I just negotiated with them that that wasn't something I was willing to do. But I have to tell you, I found that if I'm effective, they'll work with me and um, accommodate that request, and it actually worked out pretty well, and I found that I actually prioritized my time and got a lot done. And I think my work product was probably equal to or even greater than, in some cases, a full-time employee. So it was a win-win for me and those agencies. So to show up, You've got to have, I don't know what happened here with this hard to turn, um, marketable skills. Please, if there's one thing, I'm begging you, learn to write and write well. It makes all the difference. The employees in my shop who write well rise. And it doesn't matter if it's communications or policy or um, just rough analysis of data. Those who can communicate well in writing and verbally rise. They're the leaders. They're counted on and they're the ones who can organize. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are if you can't articulate it in a meaningful, concise way. And I have to tell you, the people entering the workforce right now, nobody's writing. Nobody is writing. And it, it, it is a heavily sought after skill set right now. I just cannot underscore that enough. So learn to write, think critically, and analyze issues. Hone your critical thinking skills. Um, the other thing is prioritize professionalism. Um, I noticed an inclination for casual dress and casual behavior interface. I think sometimes we've gotten too lax, and professionalism makes a huge difference in separating you from the crowd because people become more confident in your ability to represent them well. Very rarely are you the CEO, and when you're the CEO of Apple, you can dress any way you please. But until then, you're probably representing somebody else most of the time. And I would recommend that you find a way to be as professional as possible. I had um, one sister-in-law who approached me who said, Ali, I do not have money for clothes right now. You know what? I didn't either. In all of those campaigns, we were just starting out. We were you know, buying a starter home, having babies, didn't have a lot of money. You know, I just went simply to DI and picked up a couple blazers and plain old skirts and did my best to be professional. And it made a difference, and it works. It doesn't matter if your suit's expensive or not. It's whether or not it's clean and pressed and you are put together. So I, I'm, I, it's, it's more than dress. It's also your word choice. It's how you present yourself. Makes a huge difference. And hone your communication skills, no matter what profession you're in. The thing I loved about my public relations classes was I found public relations went across industries, and so does public affairs. Um, if you want to be a specialist in the energy industry, if you want to be a specialist in healthcare, you can find a niche there, but there's always a need for public affairs representatives, whether it's working in a state agency or working as a lobbyist or working in a nonprofit. 
public affairs has a broad array of subject matters in which you can become an expert. But they all need good communicators. Um, few lessons. In every position I've had, I've tried to learn something. And there are some take homes from my experiences. The first one is sometimes slow is fast. It is, it's, it's um, not uncommon for someone new in their career to run headfirst into a situation with ambition and initiative and creative ideas and, and think we should create change now. Because the reality is sometimes it takes time to change public opinion, people's ideas. Um, sometimes it needs to, um, the phrase I like is distill upon their consciousness. It just needs to kind of sit for a minute and feel comfortable. And I have learned in my career that while I might have a great action plan and I can see the end from the beginning and I know where I want to go with an issue or I know how to solve this problem, I'm not going to do it alone, especially not in the public sector. I'm going to have to bring other human beings, other fallible, impressionable human beings with their own ideas along. And it might take some time. But in the long run, taking my time and bringing them along and getting buy-in is actually the fastest way to do it. Because if I run headfirst into that wall, I'm not moving a thing. The wall wins. But if I give it time and I find a way around it, or I find a way, a door through it, I'm going to be successful and I'm going to get there faster. So I learned slow is fast. But the other caveat to that is sometimes slow is just slow <laughs> and windows close. It's a sense of timing. It's a sense of knowing when you're losing momentum in a sense of knowing when a decision must be urgent. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of judgment. But don't miss opportunities just because you have fears or a reluctance or hesitation to engage. Sometimes um, there's a need to motivate others and create a sense of urgency. Uh, differentiating between the two takes a little bit of experience and good judgment and maybe some prayer. Um, the other piece that, that I find, I find a lot of um, my younger employees in particular over time get really frustrated that we can't reprogram somebody, whether it's the director of an agency or even the governor of the state. Um, and they get frustrated that we don't have resource, that we don't have enough time. And one, s one very powerful lesson that made all the difference when I learned it um, was to manage from where I am with what I have. To recognize my job is not going to always have the ideal tools and resources at my disposal or the ideal players or partners. I might have um, a, co a colleague who may not understand an issue or I might not have enough money to publish that great print piece that I really need to get out to 6,000 households today. Um, I have to find a way to manage with what I have and spending energy and time and and my personal resource worrying about what should be and what the ideal is and if only is a complete waste. It's a complete waste. The best thing to do is understand I need to manage. My job is not to have the ideal. My job is to manage this situation with what I have. And as soon as I can get over the spinning of the wheels, I start to find solutions. It's a, it's a, it was a, like a moment of light entered my eyes. OK, um, the la other thing is see people for their potential. Uh, there's no perfect employee out there, and there is no perfect boss, and we're all on a path. And the minute you abandon expectations for the ideal, and you see people for what they are becoming, and what they have the potential to be, you will find not only a peace, but the ability to solve problems. If you have confidence in somebody that they're going to get there, that energy affects the dynamic in the room. And um, I've often found that this, this applies more to those who supervise me than those who work for me. Um, I try to use it as a, as, an, as a supervisor and as a leader in my office, but um, I also try to see the people for whom I work for what they are becoming. I've known Gary Herbert for 20 years, and when I first met Gary Herbert, he was um, entertaining a, a, a run for Congress. He actually ran for Congress for about three months and withdrew just before the county convention started. His youngest son, Brad, was 10 years old, and he didn't want to commute to Washington, D.C. So he ultimately withdrew from the, the congressional race and decided to run for re-election for his uh, county commission race in Utah County, which we then helped on. Um, but the Gary Herbert I know now has grown 
tremendously, both in knowledge, in process understanding, in presentation ability, in his um, ability to give a speech. He, he's, he's made a lot of progress, and I think he has a, a lot more um, in him. You know, he's, he's a little bit older than I am, but he's not the end of his life or the end of his career. And, um, you know, he's, he's becoming a real leader in, in a lot of people's eyes. And better. Oh, I'm sorry, my assistant did this presentation for me and, and gave it to me, this is my life, like three minutes before I walked out the door. <laughs> so I just said, do your best, I trust you, Liz. She does a great job. Um, my next point is step up. Set yourself apart and be aware of stereotypes. Boy, did I buy into the stereotypes. I was, I was a girl who grew up saying, I'm never going to be what you. I'm never going to be what you. Um, my parents divorced. I lived in Arizona um, after 13 different moves. We ended up in Arizona. And my parents divorced my senior year of high school, and I really wanted to go debate for Northwestern. That's where I really wanted to be, but financially it was not reality. Had a fluoride scholarship here, wanted to get out of Arizona where I had tons of scholarship money and you know I could have bought a car and stayed there and been fine, but needed a little distance. Came to BYU. Um, I was not getting married. Not going to be a BYU stereotype. I was engaged as a freshman, married a return missionary. <laughs> you know, um, my husband drags me in to meet as bishop for what I didn't know was uh, an interview to assess me. And uh, he's a, turns out he's like an HR professor here somewhere, human resource professor. He gives me this lecture. You're going to be pregnant in 15 months. There's only a 15% chance you'll ever graduate from the school. Um, chances are you're going to be home with your babies for 23 years. I mean, he, he reinforced everything negative about the stereotype that I was never going to be. And I was like, oh, you don't even know me. I was so incensed by that, but probably heavily motivated because there are a lot of times in my head I've thought, Oh, I'm going to prove him wrong. Um, I am the cliche, but I'm not. I am not that stereotype. Those stereotypes were in my head. So I'd really warn you to be open-minded and recognize when the problem is really your way of thinking. And you need to set yourself apart for who you are. So recognize your own gifts early. And don't buy into, I've got to be this list of whatever to get this job or I've got to be this list of whatever to be this, the right spouse. Abandon that, abandon the stereotypes, and be open to who you are and what your strengths are. And realize when you're selling yourself for a post, it's based on your strongest skill set. So know what they are and articulate them. Um, set yourself apart in the workplace by volunteering. In the community, get involved. Stay in touch with real people. Stay in touch with people outside of your office or outside of your dynamic. Put yourself in an uncomfortable place every once in a while. Volunteer at a shelter or volunteer at the hospital or just go down and help clean up a park. It'll make you feel good, but it'll also give you some perspective, and that's really important. It'll also give you some fresh, um, fresh ideas when it comes to the workplace. Find your passion. Do not settle. Don't work in a profession where it's mundane and routine and you're not stimulated and you're not excited to go to work every day, find something that motivates you because if you're passionate about it, you will excel. If you're really passionate about Italy, be the best Italian expert there is, right? I have a brother-in-law who wants to be an expert in Macedonia and he is currently there on a Rhodes Scholarship. They just landed two days ago and I'm like, Macedonia? Really? I mean, are, is it still a country? You know, I. I wasn't even sure, I had to go find it on a map. And you know, then I started reading about Cleopatra. It's got a great history. But he wants to be a world expert on Macedonia. And boy, is he taking it to the extremes. He's dragged my sister and their two kids and they're gonna be over there and there, aren't, there, aren't, there's no one, there are no LDS people anywhere. They're like one of four people in the country that are LDS. Um, find a mentor. This is really hard if you're a woman, by the way. Really hard. But find a mentor and ask them to be your mentor and say, I think the world of you, can I talk to you every once in a while and bounce ideas off of you? You don't have to sit down and say, would you be my mentor and make it this formal arrangement, but hey, can we go to lunch every once in a while so I can pick your brain on what I'm doing with my career? Um, it, it makes a world of difference to have somebody who sees you through a different lens, who can guide you from their end of the world and life. And um, I actually think it's a real honor to be asked. 
and people feel a responsibility to look out for you when you have those kind of conversations with them. And I find, especially in politics, they'll call you and give you a heads up. I have a couple of, of friends who are probably senior in their careers to me who I consider to be my mentors. And during the grandma crisis, I called them a few times and just said, you know, what's being said out there? What's going on? What do you think of this statement? What's happening here? It was, it's very useful to have somebody with a different perspective on you and on your career to give you some feedback. Um, join a professional organization. Be really careful here. You know, be selective. Don't waste your time joining 10 organizations, but get involved in two or three meaningful ones. You know, volunteer in their little subcommittees. Help them out at their fundraisers. Network, meet people, and it will broaden your horizons professionally. You might realize that there are careers you never heard of that really sound interesting to you, and you might find, and I have as well, uh, this is how I've found some of my, my other jobs, um, or, or connections that these professional organizations are great um, incubators for future projects, for public policy solutions sometimes, and for stakeholders and partner arrangements. So that leads into networking, especially in politics. You need everybody you can, but always be yourself and be authentic. I know the difference between somebody who's there to exploit and somebody who's there to genuinely connect. There's a difference in that handshake. There's a difference in that energy. Um, network and, and do it in a professional and memorable way. Um, have a business card. Even if you're a student and it just says BYU student on it, have a card you can leave with somebody. And I know business cards are becoming outdated, but believe me, it's that take home, right? That they take home and they enter into their phone or they scan it into their program. But um, at every event I've ever been to, and, and, and this is sort of an eye-opening thing, especially on the national circuit when you're trying to meet people, if I have a business card, I'm going to write a note about that person on the back so when I get home, I can remember a little bit about them and I remember having met them. If they haven't given me a business card, I'm probably not going to remember having met them. So find a way to network and make yourself memorable and then also leverage your time. Do not waste your time in projects that aren't going anywhere or relationships that are trivial, but make the most of the opportunities you have. So if you're joining an organization and you want to get some writing material in your portfolio, a volunteer to serve on a committee where you can write and get portfolio material and you can network and maybe you can volunteer on a project. But make the most of the time you have. And then find ways to be, have management experience. Volunteer to be the lead on a team. You don't have to be the supervisor in the shop, but you can say, let me be the lead on that project. Let me organize the three or four people that need to work around that issue. Um, I'll be the one who writes what everybody says in the room. I mean, s people hate to take notes because you feel like you're being relegated to a secretarial role, but in the reality, you're controlling the document that gives the identity to that project. So find ways to um, show that you're a leader. And maybe the better term there is seek leadership experience. And then ask for feedback. Ask for it. Now, I have worked for a few really nice guys. Palmer DePaulis, Gary Herbert. Palmer DePaulis was the mayor of Salt Lake City in um, mid-80s. I don't know if you recall in 83 when there was um, flooding and State Street was turned into a river. Some of you may not have even been born then, I realize. Um, Palmer was public works director. Ted Wilson was the mayor. Palmer later became the mayor. Palmer is Catholic, Italian, Democrat, and probably the most Christian leader I've ever worked with tender-hearted, sweet, sees the good in everybody, sees everybody for their potential. Sometimes has a hard time making a decision because he sees all the facets and wants to study it and understand it. And um, I was his deputy director of community and culture. We were a great team. Republican, Mormon, woman, Catholic, Democrat. I mean, I, I, we, we, we handled the legislature pretty well and I thought we articulated our issues well. And I went to Palmer because everybody else is getting um, performance reviews, and he didn't think I needed one. And I went to him and said, G uh, Palmer, I need to know, like, what am I doing right? What am I not doing well? What can I do better? How can I manage this better? And he's like, Howie, you're great. You're great. You're doing wonderful. No, really, I need some feedback. I mean, it was a half hour of nothing but frustration, and it felt like um, false praise in some ways. I mean, I know he meant it, but it was just because he's a nice guy and he defaulted to the nice guy mode. Um, but I said to him, okay, I'm gonna meet with you again in a week. 
And I really want you to think about this question because I want to get better and I want to be better. I want to do a better job for you and for our agency and for our constituents and for the state of Utah. I feel like I, can, I need some feedback. And I recognize sometimes because I'm you know, 5'11 and there's no shortage of opinions in this person, sometimes I intimidate people and, and I feared maybe he worried I'd be too defensive. And I said, I'm not going to be defensive. I really want to know what you're thinking. Um, so I gave him a full week to come back and offer me some feedback. And it was, Allie, um, you just need to get into the white space a little bit more. I have no idea to this day what he meant by that. <laughs> I don't know what he meant. I'm still figuring it out. But <laughs> it stretched me a little bit. I thought, where's the white space and what does that mean? And um, he said, like, you need to step back, not just like to the 30,000 foot level, but like past the moon and look back. Um, it reminded me like focus on what's really important and take a breath. And I'm a planner. I, Palmer, w when we talk, you know, we talk from A to Z. I, he knew where Z was. I was the one who mapped out B to Y. You know, here's how we get here. I'm an organizer. I'm a planner. I'm a strategist. I, I get all the pieces. I understand dynamics and I like to fit all the cogs together. Palmer's one who likes everyone to feel good about it, you know. And when we get there, we're going to have a party. Um, it was really hard for me to think about white space. <laughs> really, really hard. I had the same conversation with the governor about a week and a half ago when I said, Governor, I've been here, you know, more than six months and I'd kind of like to know, like, do you like your speaking points? You know, how's the messaging feeling? Are you uncomfortable with anything? You know, are you getting stuff on time? Oh, you're doing a great job. Oh, please. <laughs> Flashback, you know. I thought I was having the same conversation. So I, I gave the governor some time. He's in New York and Washington, D.C., and when he comes back, I'm on his calendar because I want some feedback. You never really can ever be perfect, right? You always need that feedback to get better. And my lesson there was it might take my boss a little while to think about that. Um, so ask your mentor for feedback. Ask your wife or husband for feedback. Ask your colleagues for feedback. And the best review I ever learned was from a guy who worked for me who served in the, in the Army. Um, He'd been in Iraq during the first Bush administration and worked with Schwarzkopf. And he said, peer review is far more valuable than leader review. And if you can find a way to get your peers to be honest with you, they'll tell you what your greatest strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I've also learned to remember there's opportunity and difficulty. At first, um, I didn't want to deal with the problems that arose in organizations. I was sort of avoid conflict, right? There's opportunity in conflict. There's an opportunity to prove yourself and there's an opportunity to solve problems. And most importantly, there's an opportunity for growth. Don't miss out. Don't shy away. There's a time and a season for everything. As the mother of four, um, I, I never considered myself a professional woman. This is my first full-time job. And uh, that's sort of bizarre to say, but I'm a firm believer when the time is right, things will happen for you. And be willing and grateful for your time to drive the minivan. Oh my gosh, talk about a transition. It was really hard to become the mom who drove the minivan. I resisted for a very long time, but a minivan's a great thing when you've got four kids to haul around. And I remember listening to a um, song by Natalie Merchant, uh, this is the time, is that what it is? Uh, she talks about this is the time to enjoy and breathe. And it was a powerful, moving experience for me to say, you know what, there are times when I'm gonna drive the minivan. Maybe there's a time when I'll get a sports car, probably not, because my husband and I are far too cheap and realistic. Um, but I do want a Harley, I'm still waiting. Um, but there's a time and a season. There's a time to be the heavy lifter at work, and there's a time to be the spokesperson and there's a time to be the brainiac. And sometimes there's just a time to clean up after the, the work party and do your share to put the chairs away. Um, cultivate personal curiosity and always ask questions. Ask questions, try to learn, figure it out. Don't ever assume you know it all. Even if you really probably are the smartest person in the room, you can learn from everyone else. Um, there were turning points in my life. When I learned a post and I felt like I really knew it, I could feel the tremors in every job I've ever had. I can feel when the tremors happen when there's something else around the corner. 
and I felt it at community and culture when I felt like I'd hit the point of maximum impact. Palmer DePaul's a sweet guy, nice man, um, great agency, good friends, good colleagues, loved it, was having a great time. And um, I just felt like maybe it was time for a change. And three months later, I got a job offer from Workforce Services to go work for Kristen Cox. I don't know if you guys know who she is. She's brilliant. She ran for Lieutenant Governor of Maryland. She is blind. And there is no better executive director in state government. She's also a mom and um, fearless. Runs a really big organization, has done a great job making some cuts, and it's the polar opposite of community and culture. Great chance for me to learn. And um, I also learned, like I mentioned at DCC, when I reached that point of impact and I considered other possibilities, I sort of opened it up to the universe, things happen. Um, the last point I want to make in conclusion is lift up. And this is the sign of a true leader. Um, I've always been a student of leadership. And I went through a time when, boy, did I feel disillusioned. I thought, where are the leaders? Where are the authentic leaders? People with vision, people with principle, people with insight, who know the direction they're going and how they're gonna get there. People with integrity and courage. It seemed at that point in my life like there just were no leaders anywhere. And I was so discouraged and depressed about it. Um, and I didn't even feel like voting. Oh, <laughs> political science major. That's like anarchy. So, um, but I realized, boy, did I have high standards and I needed to take it easy on human beings because um, there are people who are becoming authentic leaders. There are people who are becoming the kind of um, passionate leaders that we need to make a change. And I feel tremors now that our nation is at a turning point and we really need some authentic leaders with courage who step up and remind people what is right and what is true, who don't say the politically correct thing just because it sounds nice or who fear repercussions if they don't. Um, but I also learned there's no such thing as the perfect candidate or leader because we're all human. Um, I remember thinking this, it was the day I wanted to kill Mark Shirtliff. He was running for attorney general, it was his first race. Mark is a giant Boy Scout. He's a good guy and um, really fun to work for. Great storyteller, you know, throw him in front of a microphone, he just dazzles. He cries at everything. Ugh. Women loved him because he just would bawl. Um, but he is smart and he knows his stuff. And we had worked so hard campaigning and he goes to the convention, the state convention. We'd, he wouldn't rehearse his speech with me. This is one of those moments where it's like, give him your best thinking and then back away. He would not rehearse his speech. And he just said, you know, I want it to be real. So you've given it to me. I know my points. I know what I need to say. I'm there. It'll be good. And I stood at the top of the E Center at the, at the door and listened to the man give his Academy Award speech and click like this between his words because his mouth is so dry like mine is right now. Um, he, I don't know what speech he gave. It was not the speech we wrote or talked about or strategized about or I had nightmares about. He thanked his mother, his father, his dog catcher, I mean, everything. And my life flashed before my eyes. <laughs> and we ended up in a primary election. Um, we should not have been in a primary. If he'd given the speech he was supposed to give, I'm pretty sure the delegates would have been with us. And I realized I have to forgive him or I'm gonna kill him the rest of the campaign. I'm gonna resent the fact that he made that call. He's not perfect. He learned a really good lesson that day. He learned to be prepared and not default to what he thought were good instincts because they weren't good instincts at the time. He's better now. He listens to people. I take no responsibility for what he's done the last five years. Um, <laughs> I still love him. He's a good guy. Um, there are those who are uniquely well, well suited for their circumstance whose time is now. Um, I've, it's really interesting to me to see the contrast between Governor Huntsman and Governor Herbert. They're friends and, and allies and colleagues. You know, they campaign together, um, but they are vastly different people. And people have Huntsman expectations of Governor Herbert, and we have to keep reminding them, totally different guy here. New player, new rules, different dynamic. And we have to be willing to adjust. But I have to tell you, when we dealt with the immigration issue, there were times where I thought, that this is why this man is in this chair right now. Um, you know, he's, he may not be the shiniest, polished person, 
but he is authentic. Um, he's very uncomfortable speaking. He still gets really nervous. He probably doesn't want me to tell you that. Um, he, he, he's a real guy. It's, he's, he's just like your Uncle Gary. And, and he relates really well with people one-on-one, -on -one, but you put him in front of a microphone or a camera, sometimes he rocks, he just nails it. And there are other times I think, oh, he needed a little more sleep. <laughs> um, but he is suited for the decisions he's making, or I would not be working for him. A little political editorializing then. But I really feel like there are different candidates with different, different strengths who have the right time. Also, one thing I've always learned or felt strongly about, not neglecting personal courtesies. Take care of the clerical staff, the assistants, the doormen, the custodial staff. These people save your bacon in times of crisis. When the printer or the projector is not working or when you've got five minutes to <laughs> grab your presentation and run to BYU, um, they save you. And there is no excuse for abusing people just because they work for you or because they don't have um, the same professional status you have, um, always be courteous. And in politics, one thing I've learned that people do that bothers me is they'll talk to you and they're always looking to see who else is around and coming because they don't wanna miss an opportunity to network. Don't forget there's a person standing in front of you who's a real person and they're there to talk to you and they deserve your attention and your full engagement at the time. And if you don't forget personal courtesy, uh, it will serve you well in the right situations. You will know when your audience has had enough. You will know when, um, when your issue is rubbing people the wrong way. You'll learn to read cues, and you'll just be a better person altogether. I have also feel strongly about life balance. I can't really say I'm practicing this very well right now. This is probably the biggest challenge I have. My job is a little more than full-time. It was a family council decision for me to take this position. My husband works full-time as government affairs director for CenturyLink, used to be Quest in Utah. It's a good thing he's in the public sector because he knows what my job entails and he's extraordinarily supportive. And my kids are supportive, but it's not easy. And um, life balance keeps you balanced at work. So when, when you feel your life is out of balance, you're not your best self. You're not making the best decisions. Um, so breathe deeply, find some perspective, put people first. And sometimes that just means driving up the canyon where your cell phone doesn't work and inhaling for a moment and then exhaling deeply. Um, I want to share with you one of my favorite quotes. The state art collection is named after Alice Merrill Horn. She was one of the first state representatives uh, who was a woman. And Alice was a PR pro. She was against dirty air, think coal burning stoves. She wanted people to use clean burning fuel. She gets her girlfriend, their husbands haul their stoves down to the corner of State and Maine in Salt Lake City. They don white skirts, white blouses, white gloves and they cook with their clean burning fuel and they call all the reporters and say, great photo, come down to town. You know, the Capitol's up the hill in the background and they're touting clean burning fuel. This woman had six kids, total advocate, loved the arts, loved culture, put flowers on the desks of legislators when she served there. The best story, she buys a ticket to the Fair Parks drawing for a free car. And well, the guy's selling it, she's like, why should I buy your ticket? And she goes, he goes, you're gonna buy the winning ticket takes him at his word, buys the ticket, goes to the fair, gets up there, they, they, they have the, the drawing for the, the car, and she walks right up on stage. They've not even like, pulled the ticket out yet, and she's standing there, and the guy notices her, and <laughs> she goes, I, I've got the winning ticket. He draws the first ticket out, reads the number, it's not her ticket. But the person whose ticket it is, is not present to win, as is what's required. They draw out the next ticket, it's Alice Merrill Horn's ticket. She wins this car, she cannot drive. She doesn't even have a license. So she equips the car with wooden blocks on the pedals and has her 10 year old son drive her all over the state to collect pennies from school children to purchase art for the schools. She's spitfire, I love this woman. Um, but I love this quote, every spirit which enters mortality comes stamped with infinity, with the power to reach out and grow illimitably. This heaven-given possibility is intensely individual in character since that identity comes from the fact that each soul has within it a gift, a possibility, a power, a characteristic, your list of talents, your list of skills, whatever you will, which distinguishes it from any other soul. Who can conceive of a nobler effect of, a, of higher law than the individuality of the soul? 
As a people, we build upon the belief that soul identity will, in its very nature, survive even through the ages of eternity. Actual experience, hang with me, it's long, I know. Actual experience demonstrates that each one of our friends is superior in some particular way, not only to us, but to all our other friends. Gets longer, sorry. The insight to recognize the capabilities of those among whom one moves marks the degree of greatness and leadership. Let me repeat that. The insight to recognize the capabilities of those among one whom one moves marks the degree of greatness and leadership. And the true leader organizes these forces to advance his own high purposes, feeling a double joy in the knowledge that his comrades grow with him by using their gifts. However, it's not sufficient that others are helped to realization of themselves. Each soul has a higher duty to discover his own infinity. In the secret moment, something will whisper, you can, you must. Though it necessitates devotion and sacrifice, listen to the inf infinite of your soul when it calls. Listen to the infinite of your soul. And a true leader brings out that infinite ability in others around them. And I just want to leave that with you, that I hope in your careers and in your life choices, you're elevating, you're showing up fully prepared and ready. You're differentiating yourself by stepping up and volunteering and taking assignments, standing apart, and that you're lifting up by being a true leader, by recognizing the infinite of, of, among you, of those among you and knowing how to bring those possibilities to reality, helping people realize the most they can be. That's real leadership. That's tough stuff, but it makes all the difference. Um, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with you today. Um, I, I know I've gone a little bit long. I apologize. I, I wish I had great stories and was super funny like Bud Scruggs. I'm not so funny, but um, I'm happy to share with you if you want to stay for a few minutes. I know some of you have got things to do. It's almost it's 5 o'clock, but if you've got questions, I'm happy to take them now.